And what I'm going to talk to you about is basically administrative and reimbursement things. And I want to report about the first two um, cases that we have done in Homburg. Um, my interest in, in the esophagus goes back about 20 years when I had the privilege to develop esophageal surgery, basically in Bern, Switzerland, um, at that time. And I was mostly interested in complications after esophageal resections, namely acute lung injury, gastric uh, tube perfusion and such. That was my interest and that's how I got into that field. Now, <clears throat> when I took over that chair uh, down here in Homburg, um, of course I had to change the whole, my whole focus of the work. Uh, like most German surgeons would do, you get a broader spectrum, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. Now, Homburg down here is not to be confused for the people who are not f familiar with the German, uh, the German map, with Hamburg up here or with Bad Homburg, just outside the doors of Frankfurt. It's a town of about 40,000 people, um, but we service basically uh, a big chunk of uh, naturally the Saarland and the surrounding Rheinland Pfalz. Um, and this is about the things that we are doing. Um, as I said, I changed my, uh, my focus of my work according to the clinical demand. Um, <clears throat> we do general surgery basically on a, as a provisional surgery for the local population. We focused on oncological surgery. We still do esophageal surgery. We do them all open, not minimal, minimal, minimally invasive. Uh, 120 pancreatic resections, liver resections. We started a liver transplant program. I've done uh, 31 last year. We run a vascular service, pediatric service, and all of that with 30 people, basically. Um, and uh, in order to do that, you have to restructure the whole thing. This is what we have done, basically, with clinical pathways. I'm not going to go into detail, but maybe for my German colleagues, this is an interesting chart. Um, it just gives you a moment analysis what all of the surgeons in my department basically do over a whole year the percentage of documentation in my department by running IT-based clinical pathways is 7.8% um, waiting time for, for new uh, documents and, and stuff like that is very limited. So that basically my doctors spend only, as I said, 10-15% of their time in documentation, 66% of their time directly with the patient. My senior surgeons, the OBA, it's the 60 time, 60 percent of their time in the OR. And on top of that, they have about 15% of all that time devoted to um, research. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> um, as I've said, I've become uh, interested in the esophagus about 20 years ago. And before I took over that chair, um, I traveled basically um, to all the esophageal centers uh, around the world. I was in Japan, I was in Hong Kong, I was in Los Angeles with Dr. Demister, just to brush up basically my knowledge and look at the people who have been what I thought were the best at that time in the field. I did go to New York also to see some of the colleagues there, and I thought they did a pretty nice job too. Um, <clears throat> and after having had that chair for 10 years, I was just about ready to go out again and look what has happened, not just from the literature, but really what people are doing on site. So in order to do that for the, for the foreground, I went to the esophagus meeting in Hawaii, and that's how I got exposed to the Lynx procedure. Um, and uh, just looking at, it, for the first time, it, it was to me a very convincing concept. It looked very simple, and usually, more or less, when things look very simple, uh, so simple that you wonder why you didn't bring up that idea yourself, they are usually very good things. And um, <clears throat> it, to me, it almost looks as if nature would have to find an answer to reflux, it probably would de uh, devise a uh, 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 anything like that, rather than a, a, a nissen van der plication. So, <clears throat> um, having thought about that procedure and having met the people who ran that whole company, um, there was that nice procedure that, that stuck out basically and the device that I thought was pretty convincing. But what I also liked is that they didn't really push the market. Um, we all know that in laparoscopic surgery, people often, very often, push things into the market, be, be new procedures, be new devices, and this was not the case here. And you really had the feeling that people know what they are doing and they wanted to develop that. Um, and I'm coming to that uh, in my discussion slide a little bit. So what we had done then in, in June, we started a meeting together with our gastroenterologists, told them about the procedure, um, and I got the ethical committee approval in July, which is basically then available for all the German centers if they want to participate in the prospective um, database. Um, we do have that uh, ethical committee approval, so it's easily available for anybody else who would want to participate in that. In September of, um, of 2010, then I went ahead to our administrators after we had seen two patients. 
um, that we thought would probably be um, good candidates. And as you all know, the gastroenterologists usually send the, the worst patients to the surgeon. Now, those two patients, they really required surgery. They said, you're fed up, and I'm going to come to that in a minute, too. Um, and then um, we talked about, uh, um, about financial issues, um, about commercial issues that the company had, and Brent Collins was very open about that. And they needed to have uh, the European centers open or the German centers open. And that was one of the keystones by the end of 2010 in order to have the, uh, uh, the investors basically stay on the thing and being convinced that this is a thing that should stay in the market. I really went ahead and tried to do our first case in December of 2010. In February of 2011, we did our uh, second case. And uh, then after we had done that, that's, that's basically in March, Sorry for that. Uh, in March, our administrative um, director, he basically withdrew the approval. And I asked him why that was. I never got, got a written statement for that. Um, but I think it had to do with the rejection of the NUP antrag. I think that was declined or basically was given second, second priority. Now, the NUP is basically for the, the, the non-German or the people not familiar with our German system. It's a system where you can apply for public funding um, by, the, by the caregivers, basically, that whenever you have a new procedure, it needs to be approved by a committee, and then the health insurers have to pay for that if it's approved by that committee. Um, and apparently, the links uh, was given a secondary ranking, which means it's not approved, has not been approved for last year, but from my understanding, they're trying to approve it again for this year. Maybe then we get public funding for that. So those were the two patients that we have done. The first patient is 60 four-year-old gentleman, um, he had 30 years of, uh, of uh, multiply um, proven gastroesophageal reflux disease. He had a PPI dose escalation and he still was symptomatic. Um, what was complicating, he had a severe rheumatoid arthritis and he was uh, needing any uh, um, um, painkillers for that. That certainly aggravated the whole situation. Um, we basically ran through all the uh, inclusion criteria that are there in, in the prospective trial, and uh, the patient came out with, uh, um, with 32 points on his uh, uh, GERD uh, quality of life score. We did the procedure at the end of, um, of November in 2010. It took me uh, uh, nearly two hours, well, a little bit more than one and a half hours, the problem was that I couldn't get the ring closed. The ring placement itself was rather simple, but I just couldn't get the lock closed. So we took it out and put in a second one, and what we found out, or what the people back in, in Los Angeles found out, and in the United States found out, that the lock somehow was crooked. And maybe I took it with a grasp, which I'm not 100% sure, it was crooked just by manufacturing. And that's why I just couldn't close it. Um, the, the dissection was pretty simple, and um, I've also had the training um, in Milan, just like everybody who does the procedure in Germany does. Um, I had the training there, and we both had seen um, basically the minimal dissection. That's what we had done. Um, the people from Links, uh, or from, uh, from Thorax, came over, and they basically supervised the whole procedure. They were there, too. Um, and uh, as I said, it took me a rather long time. But the patient was doing excellent postoperatively. Um, I did the procedure, I think it was on a Friday. We discharged the gentleman on Monday because just we don't discharge him on, on Sundays. Um, and, uh, but he was truly fine on the first, second post-operative day. Um, we had seen him again in uh, January of 2011. He did not have any reflux, no regurgitation at that point in time. Um, I had mentioned that he had severe breathing problems um, preoperatively, and his breathing had improved so much that he was being able to go back basically to his uh, early morning physical exercise. That was one of the biggest surprises for him. Um, he lost an additional, uh, he lost six kilograms of weight, and he did have dysphagia in the beginning. Um, that's what he complained most the first two or three days, the dysphagia, and I just went back to the people, um, to Brent and, and talked to him, and we both talked to the patient and said he has to eat, he has to go back and swallow, he has to force himself to really make sure that he trains the device down there. And this is what he has done, and um, he has been fine ever since. Then we did our second patient, <coughs> who was a 26-year-old uh, young man. He had a three-year history 
of GERD, he also had pulmonary symptoms, um, grade A esophagitis. Also, his quality of life was basically limited, and he came in and he was saying, I want some kind of a surgical procedure. I cannot do that anymore. My quality of life has gone down tremendously. I need just something. So I introduced basically um, the, uh, the Lynx procedure to him, talked uh, him through the whole thing, <clears throat> and he agreed to do it too. Um, we did that then in February of 2011. Um, the procedure at that time took me about an hour. Um, I think you can do it much shorter, um, but that's not the point, I think, um, doing it very quick. Um, in the beginning, I think it's more important that you, you get the ring placed right. Um, so we had a bit of a discussion there where to really place it, and I think um, all the discussion that I had before, um, it, it's, it's um, certainly the right thing to do to place it before the the vagal branches uh, branch off to the stomach. I think that's the most important thing because you might get bleeding there. You know, all know that when you dissect down there. Um, <clears throat> in March of 2011, um, we saw the patient again. He had no reflux at that time. His breathing had improved, and this is the first thing that he said uh, or that he told me that he was being able to go back to chocolate pudding, which was one of his favorite dishes, and he had not been able to eat before. Um, and you see that his quality of life also improved at that time. This was the um, gastrography in swallow that we did in that patient. Um, just wanted to see how the device was placed. I think that was mentioned before. It's about a 45 degree angle that you see probably post-operatively, um, and that was what we had gotten. So <clears throat> I'm not going to entertain you for 45 minutes. I basically come, can come back to the conclusions at that point uh, already. Um, I think it's a technically, to me, very, very convincing procedure. Um, the word. Um, Gut machbar translates poorly into English. Um, the closest thing that I can come up with is doable. And when I say gut machbar, it means um, that the procedure is so simple that I personally worry about it that if you just spread it out too rapidly, it's going to probably be overused, probably by the people who do not know what they're doing up there at the gastroesophageal junction, but just a regular, probably very good laparoscopic surgeon, but who is not familiar with that area up there. And then I worry that after five, 10, or 15,000 procedures, we probably see the same phenomenon as we have seen with laparoscopic cholecystectomy. We see some of the most severe complications <coughs> that you can get in hepatobiliary surgery. The challenges that I see for the procedure is um, the vagal nerve injuries, and I think those are probably the complications that we might see once we have a number of thousand patients out there, um, be it false placement, being for any other reasons, being for patient side reasons, that we might see vagal nerve injuries, and you all are familiar with that, uh, if the patients have gastric emptying problems, um, those can be really devastating um, situations for the patients. If you treat those patients, they're not very happy with, with many things that you do for them. Reimbursement at this point in time is for me a problem, but I think that can be solved with the help of, of Torex Medical. They have come up with new, basically, DRG groups that we do have at this point in time. I personally think um, that we will have to go to an outpatient procedure, and I also um, agree that it's basically the patient that you have to focus on. That gives us our professional legitimation, and by the way, it also gives a professional legitimation for our hospital administrators. They only have a job because the patients are there and coming to the hospital. So I think we have to talk to them and make sure that this is the procedure that in experienced hands can certainly be done for a certain group of patients as an outpatient procedure, but it has to be reimbursed, not just on a daily basis, but on what the true costs of the procedures are. <clears throat> 